the big thing important is is the three basic elements of of what people need to have and if you want to be an entrepreneur i believe you need to have integrity you need to have intelligence and you need to have energy Hey everyone, welcome to another episode of Perfectly Mentored. I'm your host, Jason Portnoy. My guest today, Dan Young, is a creator, investor, mentor, and entrepreneur with a passion to share his experiences on maximizing financial, physical, and psychological well-being, ultimately spreading peace, happiness, and joy throughout the universe. His first entrepreneurial entrepreneurial efforts selling t-shirts in Venice Beach proved fun and lucrative. He had opened the door. Uh, he then opened a shop at a swap meet selling cutlery in his samurai costume, which we got to hear all about. After moving to Utah, the big box electronics retailer he was working for went bankrupt. He then contacted all the customers that had bought computers from him and honored their warranties at no charge. That's how PC laptops began. But in his first year, he lost $20,000 honoring those warranties. But then following year, Young's loyal customers wore in with over a million dollars in business. Today's online retail, cloud manufacturing and real estate projects have generated hundreds of million dollars in revenue and employs hundreds of US-based employees. An absolute great pleasure, my man, Dan, welcome. Hey, thanks, man. Thanks for having me on, brother. No, oh, thanks for doing this. I mean, uh, people don't know, I heard you first speak at Clubhouse, in Clubhouse, and I just love the value you bring, and I had to bring you onto the show. Uh, you have such an interesting backstory, um, you know, and how you got started. We both started our entrepreneurial journey in clothing. I actually had a t-shirt company as my first venture at, at a school. Um, but I'd love to get some more backstory on how you became the entrepreneur on a mission to create more millionaires. Tell us a little bit about your journey. So, you know, I grew up in Los Angeles, California, uh, out there. We were really poor. We were on food stamps. It was terrible. Became a delinquent, got exported to Utah, moved in with my sister. She kicked me out in 30 days and I had to figure out a way to make money. Right. Cause I was 16 years old. So, uh, started doing the swap meet gig and, uh, trying to sell stuff there. And I was selling like knives, Ginsu knives, shirts, all kinds of things. And, uh, I think it was like a hundred dollars to rent a table. And the first couple of days I didn't make anything. I felt really sad. Right. Um, and so then I was watching this late night TV commercial and there's this crazy dude and he was like chopping fruits with Ginsu knives. Right. And ropes and everything. So I'm like, Hey, I'm going to imitate that. So I pulled out my karate gi, right. Like my full on karate. Gi. I'm, I'm a yellow belt, man. That's really high. Let's kidding. <laughs> but anyway, I hey, it's, that, high, it's so higher than it's higher than a white belt. So let's give yourself some credit. <laughs> So I took that thing and just did a show for people and we made like over a thousand the first day, a couple thousand dollars the next day. And I'm like, Oh, okay. This is the formula here is to really entertain people, educate them on the product and then sell it. Right. And that's, that's how I became an entrepreneur. Really. That was, that was the key. Then scaled all the other companies. Now we've done over $600 million um, with all the different companies we have. Uh, I sit on Intel's board of advisors and um, you know, it's been a pretty cool journey. So I, I create Dan's Millionaire Code podcast, my podcast and all my social stuff to to give back because, you know, what I like to do is donate a lot to philanthropy or for and I would give to charities, which I still do, you know, but I'm like, how can I really make this impactful instead of just throwing a fish at someone's head? Like, how can I really make a difference? So I started giving out my content, you know, for free to people on the Internet um, just so that they can listen to these podcasts. Right. And I started bringing in some of my mentors, right? Some are billionaires and that, and they were sharing what, you know, they had in their heart and how they did it. And it's kind of built a pretty cool little movement. And so my idea is to create a million millionaires, um, not directly, but by teaching, you know, the listeners out there, they can be successful and then they can teach others. I love it. And look, that's exactly what this podcast is, right? It's called Perfectly Mentored, where the audience gets to listen in on me, pick the brains of some of the brightest people, some of my mentors, some of the people I think are super smart, people that they wouldn't have access to, and not just another fluff interview, but tactical, actionable advice on, on how to on how to get better. So I, I commend you on doing that, because I think it's the same thing that we're doing. Uh, but uh, just continuing in your line of, of your entrepreneurial journey, I want to just ask you about the the taking over all the warranties, right? seems like a giant risk. Are you, have yeah. you like, you're an entrepreneur, so I, I know you're, you're, you're okay with the risk, but that's a pretty big one. What went through your mind when, when you were, when you were doing that? Um, it didn't seem too tough because I knew a lot of these people. So I worked at a big box store, you know, kind of like a Best Buy circuit city type of thing. And um, 
worked there for a few years and built a great clientele, sold them computers, right? That's why I got in computers. And then the company went bankrupt. So um, I asked the manager if I could get the database. So I got those. And uh, this is before social media and iPhones and all that. So I just called everyone. I'm like, hey, man, if you, if you bought a computer here and you bought a warranty, I'll honor that. Personally, here's my pager number. And, uh, but I wasn't super nervous about it because I knew I could sell those people things if I offered real value for them, you know? And um, it worked out. So it wasn't, wasn't that scary, really. I mean, losing 20,000 something plus the first year sucked. But, you, you know, it, I think that was just like the cost of planting seeds, right? Yeah, but I mean, you have listeners who are listening in right now being like, man, I wouldn't even think about doing that. Like, have you always had that in your blood? Like, just look for the opportunity, look for the silver lining in anything that's happening? Yeah, I mean, right now we're in the midst of COVID, which is the greatest opportunity within, of the decade, right? Um, and the cycle goes every 10 years, you know, 2008, eight, nine, everything went to crap. 90% of people put their head in the sand and they get scared and just kind of wait for the storm to pass, which is stupid. You should be out there hunting for the opportunity, taking advantage of it because you have 90% less competition, right? Same thing happened in 2000, 2001, and it happens every 10 years or so. I mean, and so we're obviously sitting in the midst of it and the opportunity is just incredible right now for all you entrepreneurs. Love it. So talk about the, the millionaire code, right? Because what is this code? I'm sure everyone listening wants to be one of your uh, million millionaires that are created. So what's the code that you cracked? So really the big thing important is, is the three basic elements of, of what people need to have. And if you want to be an entrepreneur, I believe you need to have integrity. You need to have intelligence and you need to have energy. If you're missing any of those three, it's going to be really tough. I mean, maybe you could do it, but you kind of need those three to be the catalyst to, I think, to be successful uh, for long-term success as an entrepreneur. Um, but the, you know, a big key too, to being an entrepreneur, I think is being able to, to do what you do what you hate. And a lot of people are like, what do you mean do what you hate? Because a lot of people think it's a cushy thing becoming an entrepreneur, but it's not. I mean, you're going to deal with lawsuits, contractual agreements, uh, HR, hiring, firing, having hard conversations and getting ripped off and all kinds of things. But if, if you can enjoy pain and make that like a challenge and, and just really embrace it though, and not give up because, you know, most businesses fail, right? And most people aren't made to be entrepreneurs. And so it's fine. I think for some people to, to work somewhere and become an entrepreneur within an organization, but to have some protection, that's totally fine and honorable to do that. You know, but if you're just one of those insane people, then maybe entrepreneurship's for you, you know? I, yeah. There are people who watch shark tank and think that's entrepreneurship, right? I, I could go do this, but aside from just that side of things, there's major swings, right? You need a mindset. The, the lows are low when you're an entrepreneur and the highs are very high. How do you weather you know, the dips in the, in, in the, or the storms that come out? Well, one thing is this, like, so I lost, I think like $800,000 in 30 days once. That's my, one of my biggest losses. And it's just like, and I was so devastated. So I talked to some of my mentors. I'm like, Hey man, what do I do? And they're just like, did you learn something? And I said, well, yeah, I'm dumb. And they're like, well, no, did you learn something? Like, so I wrote down exactly what I learned from that experience though and told them about it. And they're like, well, that was definitely worth it uh, because now you know how to move going forward. Um, the biggest thing that people do, I think to screw themselves up is they hold remorse for themselves. And it's, you know, and you know the old saying, don't look backwards, it screws with your neck and they keep looking backwards. Um, as long as you learn from your mistakes and you just, you're still in the battle, then you know, you're probably gonna make it as long as your product's viable, right? And at what point should they give up, right? We, we all preach patience and as an entrepreneur, you got to truck through, you got to keep going. But at what point do, do you just stop and sit there and say, all right, maybe my product or service sucks. Maybe I suck or whatever the case. I mean, it's one of the biggest advice people give. Don't quit, right? You, you, it's not a loss if you don't quit, but sometimes they should quit. Yeah. I mean, you just have to be really good with your math. Look at your profit and loss statements. You know, how much is it costing you to advertise? How much does your product cost? Is your market segment big enough? Um, are there other successful people in your field? I mean, I get some of the stupidest pitches of people are like, hey, I have this product that like makes dog poop more shiny or something ridiculous, right? And I'm like, no, well, maybe people care about that, but how big is that market of people who wanna make, make their dog poop shiny, you know? And, and people get really emotionally excited about it, which is important, but you really gotta break it down to, you know, uh, you know is it viable? Is it marketable? Is there a, 
is there a big segment for you? And one of the things that I do is I start businesses that are not original. <laughs> um, because if I know like 10 people that are super successful in those industries, then I know I can take that, put a little spin on it, make it different, still be cool, you know, to all those guys. And maybe you can offer more value to them. And uh, in exchange, you know, they'll teach me what they know and then we can help each other. So um, it's all doable, but you got to make sure you, you're paying attention to the numbers. But when to give up? Um, if you're already way neck deep in it, um, you may give up because you run out of money and you're forced to give up. That's the number one problem people have. I think people should have at least a one year's income buffered before they start, uh, you know, doing trying to be on their own or, um, you know, continue to work their day job and then spend some of the evening time building their side hustle, right? Uh, instead of just like cutting themselves off so all their income's gone. So if your job brings you enough money to pay your bills, you know, just spend all that time instead of watching football, all that garbage and, you know, and build your business, right? You say you get pitched a lot. What were some of the, what do you look for in a pitch? What makes a really good pitch to you? A pro forma. So pro forma is just a prediction of what the sales are going to be and what the expenses are and how much profits left over. And what's even better in, in a pitch, because a lot of people raise money when they're doing zero revenue, which is stupid, right? Like, okay, it's an idea. I mean, when that happens, then a lot of guys will just steal people's ideas and do it themselves if they like it enough. So it's, it's really dumb. Now, if you've got momentum already and you're already selling a lot of product, let's say you've got to the point where you're selling $100,000 a year or something like that. I mean, there's no set number. But, and if there's already momentum, they got to figure it out. You can see what they call their trailing 12, which is monthly performance month by month for the last 12 months. If that performance is happening and the trajectory makes sense, then then I think about investing. So I don't care what they're selling. I, you've come a long way from, from selling t-shirts in Venice to now taking pictures, sitting on boards. What, what, what do you read? What type of research do you do? How, how do you keep getting smarter and smarter and make sure you, you sharpen your skills? Um, just, you know, a, a big thing is hang out with people who are the best in the industry, you know? And like Clubhouse is cool because like you can hang out with people. But one thing that I will say, though, is 99% of the people who portray that they're really rich, like, you know, I'm an influencer, blah, blah, blah. They're not. They're in the business of simply being influencers and taking pictures with hot chicks with pink flamingos in their pool when there's no COVID and, and sitting in front of a rented Lambo, you know. And, and the idea is they want to sell you their course. But the big test that I do is what have you built on your own? What have you really built? And you can Google that, you know, I mean. Did they really build it? If it's all their like shell articles, well, that's bullshit. It needs to be like real, real track record performance. You know. Do you, are you are you an avid reader? Do you read a lot? I do an audio book. I try to get one done a day because I'm kind of crazy like that. And I listen to it at like two x speed on Audible. Um, when I do take a little break, I'll just take a, like a week break to rest my brain, maybe ease into like another two two a week or something like that, and then go go into that cadence of one a, one book a day you went from entrepreneur to investor now. So let's talk investing for a second. Cause that's when, that's where I met you. I was listening to you give investing advice to a group that we both uh, were, were on a panel of in, in clubhouse and you have a great philosophy investing in only things, you know, and we spoke about Tesla, not just being a car company. Uh, and you gave some really good advice. How do you do research? Um, and do you, I mean, do you want to share some of your views on how you invest? Um, yeah, so I'm not a financial advisor, so I never give stock picks, but I give information on companies that I think are interesting, if you remember I said that, you know, and so people can do their own research because never buy what you don't understand, and then have a conversation with a financial uh, a professional like you did, right, and then, you know, make sure you make that, because ultimately it's your money, right? <laughs> um, so a few, uh, you want a few tools, maybe, is that what you're asking sure, for? Sure, yeah. Like me used to do research, yep. okay. Um, so something as simple as uh, on your iPhone, uh, you know, or even you have an Android, there's stock apps, right? So it's built into the iPhone. I don't know if it's on Android, but you can just punch in your stocks that you're looking at and a bunch of news comes up. So that's one, one little piece. The second one is opening a brokerage account. So for example, I have like three or four, actually four different brokerage accounts. So E-Trade, Fidelity, Schwab, some of these different ones because they all offer information resources. So if you were to type in AMD or Tesla or whatever you're looking at, 
it will have all these professional market reports written up by professional companies and all they do is do reports on on this stock right and so i like to read like four or five so if you go to like e-trade there's like three four five different ones and then information is there fidelity has some all these brokerages that are big usually have them and you can look at their actual profit and loss statements balance sheets read about what their company does what they got coming up and those people give a recommendation to professionals of what they think and what they say is not necessarily true you got to make that own deduction from your data analysis but um that's that's the best way to research also um for a broad view, Yahoo Finance, I know Yahoo's old school, but their Yahoo Finance sections, I found some pretty insightful stuff there. Um, also, you know, there's there's like Motley Fool and all these different uh, uh, things you can subscribe to. I just happen to use the free ones that come with the brokerage. So you could just drop a hundred bucks in E-Trade and then you you got 30 grand in newsletters for free, right? Like yeah. every on every stock all the time, right? Um, <laughs> And one of your biggest advice you gave is almost like, don't, don't be the guy selling the printer, right? You want to be the guy selling the ink. So you go even deeper, right? You look into like, you want to buy a stock, look into who makes those things, the parts for the company and whatnot, right? Is your, your research goes deep. Um, yeah, but it's like really obvious. I mean, this is stuff an elementary school kid could actually understand. I mean, so for example, let's just break down Tesla really simple. So a small elementary school kid can understand Tesla. People think they just make cars. Well, no, they farm data from you driving around. Right. Um, and that data helps fuel their autonomous driving engine, which is software. Right. So it drives your car automatically. And that really is one of their core pieces that, you know, they charge you per month and they're going to charge other companies like probably like Ford or GM and these guys, possibly to use their information that they've got in all of their software, right? So that's like one thing. Batteries, obviously cars take batteries. So I just Google Tesla batteries. And so then you read all this stuff about Gigafactory where Elon Musk has made a battery that's 500% more efficient than uh, the common batteries you can buy from normal uh, makers like Panasonic, let's say, right? So I'm like, huh, if his batteries are 500% better and he's sticking them in his cars, well, now they're just not a car company. They're also a battery company, right? Um, so that's pretty cool, right? Um, but that's one thing that you'll see is like with Tesla, they connect a whole ecosystem. Just like Apple is not a computer company. Apple um, sells an experience, but they also have a subscription for music, your, all your data to be backed up and all kinds of, you know, the whole Apple gamut. And they just, their idea is to get, you know, like 50 bucks or whatever a month out of you forever for your whole life, right? And, and that's, that's called reoccurring revenue, right? Instead of having to sell a car or a phone and take the money, now you're, you're paying every month like a utility, you know, like the electric company. And that's pretty valuable. So break that down for entrepreneurs. How can they learn from some of these big businesses and become not just a product or, or become an experience, become an ecosystem? So it's really simple. It doesn't matter what you sell, really. I mean, I guess it matters, but let's say you sell like, you know how everyone sells instead of fidget spinners, they sell CBD now, right? Yeah. <laughs> like everybody sells CBD. Um, so guys, I don't know if, I don't think CBD is a company to start now because everyone sells CBD. And a lot of people talk about it and they don't make money, <laughs> right? Maybe a couple people do, but whatever you're selling. So let's just say it's um, anything from toothpaste to CBD to vegetables <laughs> to um uh, air freshener you know it could be like the dumbest things you want to sell a subscription so instead of selling like hey buy 10 of these air fresheners for 100 bucks bro um you want to create a subscription so you say look we know that you're going to be using this much cbd or air freshener every month and normally you would pay 19.95 but if you subscribe, you get 25% off and we make it delivered to your doorstep every single month, right? So you make them on offer. And then let's say you get 100,000 people buying your air freshener, right? And there's a thing called a churn rate. And that means how many of those people aren't renewing? If you can get, let's say, more than 75% of the people renewing, I mean, it can even be lower. Um, you can do the math. Then you don't even have to do anything. And that money comes in while you're sleeping, right? As long as they like your product, it's actually a good product and good value. So anything can be monetized from that, from computer software, whoops, from computer, hang on, come on back, come on back at you. Sorry, someone called me. Computer software, um, all those different things can be, you know, monetized to hardware, 
to little pieces of uh, you know anything. So whatever you've got, think about subscription-based model. And let me tell you about the value of subscription-based uh, models too. Typically, if you're sorry, I'm getting blown up by some the same guy. So typically, if you have a um, someone buying your product and you're selling it, you can sell your company for three to five times what your company is actually worth, right? So, I mean, uh, selling net profit wise. So if you were to make a million a year, maybe you can sell your company for $3 million or 5 million. So five times earnings maybe. But if you have a subscription and they're not like canceling really, really a lot. So your, your, your retention rates really high. I've seen friends sell companies for a hundred times earnings. So, you know, and, and, and how do you, you, you prove this? Look at like Netflix, right? And it's all subscription, right? Look at their evaluation. It's called the P and E, right? Look at the P&E ratio, and it's astronomical compared to some companies who are just selling one product at a time. So it's 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 significant. Get your company so that people are addicted and continue to buy. Love it, and and also figure out how to go off brand too, right? So I'll give you a perfect example. Don't just become a teeth whitening company. Make other products as well. Become like Snow Teeth Whitening, for example. Became a tech company. Uh, they're also looking into dental insurance. They're trying to connect that entire ecosphere of, instead of just being a one product base. And that's after you're making a ton of money on your core offering, though. Then yeah. you can take the extra and experiment, right? Yeah. So, I mean, yeah. let's let's talk about that. You you mentor a lot of entrepreneurs. What are some of the biggest mistakes you see them make? Uh, biggest mistake they make is they run out of money. So their stuff's going good. They hit a hiccup. They run out of money. They're closed. Then they get a nine to five job and they never do it again. Right. So that's, that's the biggest, biggest mistake people make. Number one. I mean, I can give you more examples, but that's like probably the biggest <laughs> number one thing, or. I'll so how, how do you solve, how do you solve that? You're mentoring them, right? How do you then solve that? Right. They, they sit there and say, ran out of money, going to go get a nine to five. Well, what's your answer to them? Well, one, they're stupid because they didn't plan ahead of time. Maybe they just didn't know. So it's maybe, you know, but the thing is a lot of people, it's not my fault. What every, as an entrepreneur, everything's your fault. That's the one thing that you got to, you got to get down. Um, but in that situation, then they can try to save their company by raising money, by maxing their credit cards, by borrowing from friends, by, you know, creating a pitch deck and trying to bring in some VC, you know, angel investors or whatnot. Um, you can do that. But if you're, if it's hard to raise money, if you're losing money, because then they're like, you're losing money and you're asking me for money, you know, um, that's a hard pitch. I mean, it can be done, but it, it's much more difficult, you know? So th just do it right the first time by having enough buffer, right? So let's do the flip side, right? You've now interviewed a lot of millionaires or, or people who are ahead of you. I know you're doing well, but you've interviewed a lot of people who are, who are ahead of you. If you could pick one to three things that they have all, that they all have in common, what would it be? I'd say uh, long-term success. So you're talking, you know, decade, two decades plus, right? Not flash in the pan people. Because you'll see two types of entrepreneurs, flash in the pan people that are like, I got this hot new product and I'm selling it and they make a lot of money, millions of dollars, and then they can't do it again. It's not replicatable, right? Um, and then you also see people who create like uh, legacy generational wealth, you know? Um, so some of the traits though, that I would say is this, well, we talked about the integrity and the intelligence and the energy kind of being the core inter intrinsic traits. Um, but I would say making sure that you have one, um, a pro forma, again, I talked about, which is that monthly clear trajectory where you can go. And a lot of times people try to seek outside money in the beginning or, you know, after they get a little momentum, they're really excited to sell a piece of their company to bring in outside money. Um, and, and people can make, you know, can raise outside money. But if you are, make sure the first investors are people that can, that can offer value besides money um, that can help you grow, right? So that's more, kind of more strategic, strategic partner. Yeah. One who can actually offer value to help help you grow, put them on your board or something, you know. Um, but I, I've never taken outside money for our companies that I own now just because I, I don't need to. Because one thing that you can do, if you, it's slower to grow, okay? But you can take your profit and then take every penny of that and continue to scale your company by adding more salespeople, advertising, whatever you need to do, infrastructure, uh, inventory, right? Um, and that's one way. It'll grow you a little bit slower, but it builds your foundation on a rock, you know? So that's a good way to go, at least in the beginning. Because once 
you've done that for a while and let's say you own hundred percent of it and you can bring your company to like, you know, $10 million or something. Um, then you got 10 million subscription services, right? Then it's like, wow. Okay. People are like, they're going to be throwing money at you at that point. And you can ask for all the money if you want to sell it. Right. No, that's great advice. We have a lot of listeners at, who listen to the podcast who are just at the cusp of seven figures. They're doing six figures. What's the biggest difference you think in going from six to seven figures? Aside that's from more really sales, key. obviously. It's um, quality is a lack of variance. And people are like, what do you mean? Quality is the lack of variance. You want to make sure that your customer service and experience for the customer is consistent. And how do you do that, right? And also for your employees, right, as well. So you want to document all your processes, accounting, sales, marketing, logistics, operations, legal, account, you know, all this stuff. What you got to do is really take time every weekend and write down all the new things you learned. So if you fixed a certain problem with your company, like, hey, I know that we need to make social media posts uh, once, a, once a day, right, for our main core feed post. I need three stories, right? I need a newsletter to go out once a week. I need a follow-up to come up with this time after that. You have to write down the cadence of how it's written. It's almost like the scripture of running that small segment of your business. Pretty soon you'll have a corporate Bible for yourself that you've written as the founder and you can get feedback from your team and advisors. And then you make everyone in, in that one department really study that section, right? And they have to execute that cadence. And then you need to make sure at first you're holding accountability. Then you teach your managers to hold accountability and your leaders, and then you can scale. Are you shocked by how many business owners you meet that either don't know their numbers or don't have proper systems in place? Oh, uh, most don't because they, they, they just, there's like, I'm too trusting. The number one thing I hear is I'm too trusting. I just focus what I'm good at. And like, if you don't know your organization, like at least on a broad level, you know, to be a good, you know, you don't have to be the best at everything. That's impossible because we're human. Right. But you need to understand at least what expectations and key performance indicators are across the line. And you need to, you need to dig into those things from your taxes to, you know, your sales processes and all those things you can hire experts, but you need to understand. Otherwise you can't give them direction. Right. Yeah. I, so, you know, imposter syndrome is a real thing for entrepreneurs, right? We, we come in um, and, and we believe that we can't do it or we have to do everything, but there are people who are better than whatever it is. Mindset becomes a big issue. Have you experienced imposter syndrome or like, how do you, how do you take care of your mindset? Uh, what's imposter syndrome? What do you mean? Like, okay, let's, let's, let's shift gear for a second mindset's extremely important in our line of work how do you take care of your mind um the, again the three well this is the three pillars i don't know if i talked about this camera um but you have to have financial strength physical strength and spiritual strength right so in all those areas you have to have clear goals clear outcomes of what you want and how you're going to do that right and it has to be written you have to have annual timelines like i said five years, just 10 lines, 10 year, and then you know, break it out by month, week, and hour. And then you need to schedule all those things that you need to do to, to make those things a reality. I, I think that's the core fundamental of really figuring out how you can do it. Otherwise you'll just get distracted and all these different things will come up and you won't gain momentum because you don't have a process to execute, you know, on those things. There's a lot of entrepreneurs who, who are, who are really, really smart. Sometimes being too smart could be a hindrance, right? You could get in your own way. It means you have to be the smartest guy in the room. You're not hiring properly. You're a really, really smart guy. How do you work around that? Well, I'm smart at what I'm smart at. And, and I'll say I'm not smart at everything, just a small sliver of certain sections, right? But those are the areas that I've mastered, right? So, and out of the, all the things that you can master, maybe I've mastered 1% of entrepreneurial things. Um, and really, if you're an expert in those areas, but I do understand a lot of different areas. And if I don't, and again, as CEO, if I don't understand, I'll read, watch YouTube videos, do those audible books, and at least become like competent so I can know what good looks like and what bad looks like. And at what point does that become, you know, the lines get blurred of I've soaked in too much information and I'm not doing enough action. Right, because a lot of a lot of people listening, they'll listen to this podcast, then they'll go read a book, they'll now read two books when implementation matters more than 
than you know whatever whatever knowledge you're looking for right you could you could go down the rabbit hole of information all day all week all month and if you don't act on it then it's useless yeah three actions a day so everything we do if you could denote to three scheduled actions on your phone that you're going to do to move you towards one of those towards one of those goals is critical so you may pick a financial item a physical item uh and a spiritual item and a minimum pick three of those things now once you get stronger it's like working out you can do more okay so i usually have maybe like five six a day that are like really powerful actions of execution you know and and i and i don't mark my day complete until i complete those and if you start again if you go on a tear you can start really adding more but if you start dropping balls and not completing it and pushing it off, then you need to like stay, take a step backwards to go a couple steps forward. We'll kind of wrap up here. If you could, you know, if right now, let's say this podcast hit every entrepreneur listening, if you could tell them, you know, you're speaking on top of the mountain and, and you're the gospel right now, what message do you have for all of them? Your job as an entrepreneur is to, offer of true value to your customers and your and those around you in, in all directions right and the secret to that is find people's pains and help heal them simple as that if you can find pain and help heal that and you know you can can that bottle that and replicate that then you're probably going to be fairly successful you've hung around with a lot of successful dudes uh what, what, what are some of your networking tips for people listening who want to brush shoulders with you? They want to brush shoulders with some of the, the higher ups. Uh, what advice do you have for them on that? Don't ever say, can I pick your brain? Will you mentor me? Uh, <laughs> or go in with an ask or just buy this or just like troll people or just say, what can you tell me? Just don't send that stupid shit. Like really what you got to do first is look at their feed and Instagram and socials and find out what they need. What is their pain? How can you help? Um, and that's really the key. The funny thing I had, um, there's a guy that I wanted to have as a mentor, like uh, a while back. And so I'm like, man, how do I get a billionaire guy to like this guy, you know, cause I'm not a billionaire. I do well, but not a billionaire. How do I get him to really be interested in helping me? So um, I just searched that he supported a certain charity, right? And he kept posting about this like once every month and he would get all teary when he talked about this charity. So I just asked him, Hey, I noticed that you support this scholarship, you know, uh, for American Indian kids. Like, uh, that's actually a big deal. Cause I think they got the short of the stick and I align with that. You know, how can I help? That's all I asked him. And he's like, Oh, well, you could give this money to this and help this, or you could volunteer with your time or whatever it is. I'm like, I'm there. And th that's how I met him. So uh, there you go. And then after that, he was like my best bro. Cause I found out what he needed help with. There's also so many people that's, that's a, a different way of paying to get access, right? So many people are afraid to pay to get access. Uh, and, and they, you know, they worry, they, they spend the dumb, like, who was it? I, I was listening to Perry Belcher and he was talking that people will go into debt over the dumbest shit, but they won't spend money. Uh, they won't go, they won't go into debt all for the things that will get them out of debt. How important is if you can't get access to pay for access? You know, what's interesting is I have never really paid that much to get access um, because that's the, that you can do that, but that's the expensive way. And I think I'm going to more now. I mean, just kind of play with it a little bit, but I really haven't done that as far as like bought from like their event or something like that, you know? And there's a lot of value maybe for some entrepreneurs who are really doing it. If all they do is sell events and that's how they make their money, then it's probably not worth it. But if they've actually done it and it gets you in proximity and they can kind of, you know, teach you from those things, but that may get you in front of them, but then now you need to find their problem anyway and help solve that. Otherwise, why would they continually want to help you? And if they're that successful, they probably don't need your money that much, really. I mean, not really at, at, at the level, maybe you're at, if you're starting, like why, why would they bug you when they can bug institutional investors to throw, you know, half a billion on their fund? You know I mean? You know? So I don't know about that pay to play. A lot of guys really promote that and maybe it is viable. Right. But again, I just circle back around in the beginning. Cause if you're getting start started, right. Maybe you have like 50 grand is like your year's pay or whatever. Like, do you want to blow your whole wad of 50 grand? 
and then maybe, maybe not get something out of that, you know, whereas like you could probably find out what their needs are, charity they support and just give a weekend, you know, and, and then, and work side by side with them, you know, and they can see your work ethic, you know. Or you start a podcast and you have guys like you on it and come on and now you're picking their brain and you're asking to mentor them and you're asking for all these things without asking for it. Yeah, that's a great way to go. And the cool thing is, well, what's in it for me to be on your podcast? Well, you know, my core thing, one of my goals is to be able to get to more heads to be able to help them be successful. So, you know, you can pay me to be on and I wouldn't pay you to be on but meaning that if you have a certain ecosystem of people and I can help them, well, that gives me what I want too, right? 100%. And let's do that. Let's help them. Dan, for the people who want to reach out to you, they want to find out about you, how can they learn more? Uh, I would just go to my Instagram, Dan's Millionaire Code. It's one word. Also, if you want to see what our companies do to say we actually do stuff. <laughs> uh, X, oh, you're not one of those Zion. influencers? You're not one of the Clubhouse influencers? No, no, uh, but just go to Zydex, X-I-D-A-X, X-I-D-A-X.com. And we build high performance computers for people running their businesses or pro streamers or gamers. Um, just anybody who needs a powerful computer to run their empires, right? That's what we do. Dan, thank you so much. You're a super smart guy. I enjoy chatting with you. And thanks for bringing our conversation to my audience now uh, and having it with them. Thank you so, so much. Okay. Thanks, brother. I appreciate you.